uh, for his brother. And we've had a couple, we've had many, many great generations in this country where people, young men and women were willing to go off to war uh, to defend our country and, um, and lay down their lives and didn't come home. But also you think, you think about that, but then you think about what about the sacrifice that our savior made who laid down his life, not, not for a country, um, but um, basically for all of mankind and all of us who would put our faith in him. But, uh, and you know, he, the only person who ever never sinned, never deserved to die, he laid down his life for us. And how wonderful is that? And Anzac Day reminds me of that, but um, I, don't want to, I don't want to diminish the sacrifice that these men and women made because they were just so, so brave. And when you think about the 60,000 we lost in World War One, and I think 40,000 in World War Two, and um, in the flower of their youth, that's just um, what a tragedy. And we can look forward to the day when, um, we won't have to go to war. All right. Um, okay, let's have a song. And then um, I'll do the announcements. Oh, I feel a bit rusty. Um, I wasn't here last week. Um, I was a bit, bit crook, a bit crook. Oh, actually, I'm probably a bit crook all the time. But um, even just missing one week, it feels like I've been away for a year. Um, no, I, I really... I really do like coming here, um, despite the people. <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> just joking, just joking. No, it's great. I, I love, I love coming, and when I miss, I um, I do, I do miss it. And um, we won't be here. We'll be away for probably for two weeks, so we're going to miss you even more. All right, I get, we'll get some housekeeping out of the way. And a lot of this stuff you should know off by heart, but um, I'll read it anyway. Um, Please remember to exercise care when you come to church by wearing masks. Um, it's not, not mandatory, but recommended. Use the hand sanitizers available. And our hands have never been so clean. Sneeze into a tissue provided or into your arm. Um, keep social distance of 1.5 metres from each other. So get your tape measures out. And Please refrain, refrain from shaking hands or hugs. No, I didn't do so good on that one this morning. Um, if you are unwell, please stay home. And um, to quote the, the, that great theologian, Jim Croce, don't spit into the wind. For term two, instead of Bible study, we will have evangelism training for everyone after church every Sunday. The training will go for one hour every Sunday from 11 a.m. till 12 p.m. starting today, 25th of April. Weekday Bible study will not be on during term two. Uh, Sunday school is back today. Youth group and young adults fellowship has begun. Next Sunday, Kevin Murray from Australian Presbyterian Worldwide Mes Mission will visit our church and prayer night will be on next Sunday night at 6.30 p.m. Does anybody else have any announcements? Nope, okay, all right. Now, um, Jared will come up and give us the kids talk. Thanks, Jared. to the parable of the tenants, <clears throat> a parable that Jesus tells um, more so to uh, undermine the authority of the priests and the Pharisees who weren't really doing a very good job of leading God's people. <clears throat> so the question here is, what is God going to do with those who are not friends with God? What is he going to do with them? And so we see that the owner of a vineyard is compared to God who gave priests and others care over his people. But like the tenants of the vineyard, the priests and the leaders were also not very uh, good in caring and doing what God had told them to do with his people. And we see that from the tenants in the vineyard because the tenants, they were not very good at treating the servants of the owner very well either. They either injured them, they killed some of them. And it all kind of came to a point or it culminated into when um, the, the tenants then killed the son of the owner. And that then, um, I guess, begs the question, well, you know, what is this owner going to do? Is he just going to let them just keep, you know, doing what they want? Or is he actually going to bring them to justice? Is he going to make them pay for what they've done? And so what we see is that these tenants... Uh, ultimately, they are in, in their hearts, they're wicked. 
they're wicked and they have rejected God's rule over their lives. Okay, just like the priests and the Pharisees who were supposed to lead God's people correctly. And so again, what happens to people who are not friends with God? Well, God isn't just going to sit idly by and do nothing. He is going to do something about that. God is going to come to earth at the end of time to judge the living and the dead. And in that moment, if in your heart you aren't friends with God, then you will not get eternal life. And so as we finish and we answer the question, what happens to people who are not friends with God? One, you will pay for your sin. And two, you will not get eternal life because you did not believe in the one that God had sent, which was Jesus Christ. So if you are currently not friends with God, let this be a warning to you who also may have, uh, who have similar um, state with God that you reject God in your heart. May this be a warning to you. And we're now going to pray that, uh, that God will um, open your heart to him, that you will come to be friends with God because he is your only hope uh, of being saved. So let's pray. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we know that you are the only one who can bring people to yourself, that it is no through, not through any efforts of our own that we can do this, but that uh, without you, we only do evil and do what we want all the time. And that is the state of our hearts with you. And Lord, we pray that um, those among us who are still not saved by you, please uh, continue to uh, be with them and that they may continue to pray to you that you may um, save them because you are their only hope. We pray for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Enjoy the kids. Always enjoy the kids' talks. It's more on my level. But I still listen to the sermons and try to apply them. Yeah. Um, no, it's good. We get, we get good teaching here. It's really good. I've been in churches where the teaching is not so hot. Um, okay, congregational prayers. Does anybody um, have any, any prayers other than what we have down here? No? Oh, okay. All right. Um, okay. We're going to pray for all in our church family who are suffering from sickness and or injury. And there's a fair bit of that going around, although we have been spared... Um, I don't know of anybody that's, I actually, I know of one person who's had COVID. That's not in our church family, so that's good. Um, we're going to pray for the youth group and going to pray for Sunday school and we'll pray for those affected by the coronavirus. Um, I mean, there's so many things we could pray for. I mean, I think it's poor submariners and just, yeah, uh, you know, anyway, it's the world needs prayer. Okay, let's pray. Um, great Father, we we come before you now. Um, we do thank you, Father, for our church family and um, all those, Father, who are suffering from sickness and injury. Uh, Father, we pray for the youth group. Um, that they'll be strengthened and growing in you. We pray for the Sunday school. That the children um, will come to know and love you, Father. And we pray that um, you'll send us more children. And um, hopefully, and families along with those children, Father, um, that they can be taught your word, Father, because um, we, have, we are having a, a generation growing up without you, uh, without knowing you, Father. And um, that's, if that doesn't change, then this, this country has um, not got a very good future. Father, we pray for all those who are um, affected by the coronavirus all around the world, uh, especially, well, Things are going very badly in India and I know in parts of South America and um, less developed parts of the world. Please, uh, Father, help, help us in the affluent West to be able to help them get the um, vaccines and the medical help that they need. And thank you, Father, for um, that we live in a developed country, Father, where we have all of the, um, all of the facilities, Father, and all of the help um, that we can get. Uh, we pray, Father, for um, all of the elderly members of our church who, who can't be here and who are at home or um, watching on Zoom. And we, they might feel um, left out, but we, haven't, we don't forget them, Father, and we love them and they're part of our church, Father, even if they can't be here physically. Uh, Father, we, 
give you thanks and we pray and ask all these things and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. All right, now we'll have the Bible reading. Yep. Um, before Damien brings us the Damien brings us a sermon. I think I'm getting old, just trying to remember his name. Is, <laughs> that is Damien. Yeah, okay. Um, it's John chapter 7, verses 1 to 24. I think I need stronger glasses. After this, Jesus went around in Galilee, purposely staying away from Judea because the Jews there were waiting to take his life. But when the Jewish Feast of Tabernacles was near, Jesus' brother said to him, you ought to leave here and go to Judea so that your disciples may see the miracles you do. No one, wants, no one who wants to become a, pub, a public figure acts in secret. Since you are doing these things, show yourself to the world. For even his own brothers did not believe in him. Therefore, Jesus told them, the right time for me has not yet come. For you, any time is right. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify that what it does is evil. You go to the feast. I'm not yet going up to this feast because for me, the right time has not yet come. Having said this, he stayed in Galilee. However, after his brothers had left for the feast, he went also, not publicly, but in secret. Now at the feast, the Jews were watching for him and asking, where is that man? Among the crowds, there was widespread whispering about him. Some said, he is a good man. Others replied, no, he deceives the people. But no one would say anything publicly about him for fear of the Jews. Not until halfway through the feast did Jesus go up to the temple courts and begin to teach. The Jews were amazed and asked, how did this man get such learning without having studied? Jesus answered, my teaching is not my own. It comes from him, him who sent me. If anyone choose, chooses to do God's will, he will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. He who speaks on his own does so to gain honour for himself, but he who works for the honour of the one who sent him is a man of truth. There is nothing false about him. Has not Moses given you the law? Yet not one of you keeps the law. Why are you trying to kill me? You are demon possessed, the crowd answered. Who is trying to kill you? Jesus said to them, said to them, I did one miracle and you are all astonished. Yet because Moses gave you circumcision, though actually it did not come from Moses, but from the patriarchs, you circumcised a child on the Sabbath. Now, if a child can be circumcised on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses may not be broken, why are you angry with me for he healing the whole man on the Sabbath? Stop judging by mere appearances and make a right judgment. Thanks, Ron. So please keep your Bibles open on John chapter 20, chapter 7. Uh, we will keep referring back to that as we go along. Why don't we ask God for uh, his wisdom as we come uh, before his word. Let's, let's pray to God. Uh, Almighty God, we give you thanks and praise for your word, how it reveals your, your son to us. Uh, so Lord, this morning as we uh, reflect on your word in John chapter 7, uh, we pray, Lord, that you will uh, teach us who Jesus is and what motivated him uh, to do what he did. Uh, Lord, we pray that as we come to understand what Jesus did, uh, that he, this will make a, a great impact in how we live our lives as well. Uh, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> you know, we live in an interesting time when all sorts of informations are readily available, almost instantaneous. You know, what happens on the other side of the world is made known to us almost instantly, isn't it? Especially through the internet. You know, previously, like maybe 20 years ago, how long did it take for us to know anything that happens in America? Right? Well, we had to wait for the news, whether it's the printed news, newspaper on the next day or on the um, five o'clock, seven o'clock nightly uh, news program on the TV. We had to wait for the news to arrive. But now, now what happens? It just comes straight away, doesn't it? Even as, at times we know the news even before the um, media had, had a chance to write an article about it. You know, someone might tweet, someone might post it on, on their face, uh, Facebook. We have all this social media that allows us to share information almost on an instant basis, which is why we see so many people try to get famous on the internet. Why? Because they have the widest reach and quickest reach possible that we never did before. And so 
whether it is for personal fame or fortune, or whether it's for po polit political, uh, to score political points, we see people putting themselves on the internet to be visible, to be viewed by people uh, all over the world. And, and, and that is right, isn't it? A person can become instantly famous if they post something that is viral, something that catches, something that actually everyone says, oh, look at that. And everyone starts sharing, they can become very famous very quickly, which is why we have the idea of viral <clears throat> pictures, viral videos or viral memes that becomes viral in the sense that, not that in the sense of like a, a virus that you catch, but viral in the sense that everyone shares uh, the, the, the thing that has been posted. People do that, why? Because they want to be famous. They want to be the one, the next big fad. They want to be the next big hit. They want the spotlight on themselves and say, look, this is me. This is what I did. And look how clever I am. Now, why, why do they do that? Because they want to make themselves known in the world. Uh, and this is only possible because information can be shared so quickly. So on, and when we look at this kind of behavior pattern, we have to ask ourselves, why would they do that though? No, for you and me, if someone asked you, can I take a, a video of you and put, put up on the uh, on internet so that you can become famous, what would you say? Mostly sane people would say, why? No. Why would I put my face on the internet for everyone to gawk at, right? But there are many people now who see their fame, or their fortune and fame and fortune in the way that they are presented on the internet. So they post themselves uh, on the internet. They show themselves uh, so that they, they'll be on the spotlight. As I say, any publicity is good publicity, isn't it? So as long as whatever you do, it catches fire, whether it's good or bad, whether it's stupid or wise, or whether it's criminal even, they put, post it on the internet so that they can become famous for that very, for that very uh, five minutes that people pay attention to. That is why it is understandable when the brothers of Jesus comes to him and say, look, make yourself public. You know? Go out there and make, be visible, make, make people see who you are. You know, it's understandable that they actually come to him and say, if you want to be a Messiah, show yourself, Become, be, go, go in the public. Why? Because, you know, unless you're in the public, what you do and say doesn't have any real impact, does it? So, but how does Jesus respond? How does Jesus, Jesus respond to his brothers? He says, no, he won't go. He won't uh, put himself out there. And in this exchange between Jesus and his brothers, we actually see uh, what motivates Jesus in his ministry. And, and further down, when he interacts with the crowd and the Jewish leaders, we actually see in this passage what actually motivates Jesus to be in this ministry. Why did he come? And what, what, what was the purpose for doing what he did? And when we understand the motivation behind Jesus and, what, uh, and his ministry, that should have impact on us as well, shouldn't it? If our Lord was motivated by some certain things in doing his ministry, then what does that mean for us? How should we live our lives? How should we actually go about uh, living a godly life in this world if our Lord Jesus Christ did what he did? So let's turn to today's passage and see what motivated Jesus and, and see how that should impact how we live our life as well. So in John chapter 7, we see Jesus remain in Galilee. Now, you know where Galilee is, right? Galilee is to the north of, um, sort of north of Israel. Uh, <clears throat> and, and, and Galilee is almost like a, a kind of a, a backwater uh, region. It's not a, a, a very famous region. It's like a, what should I say? What's a, what's a good example? Mm, it's, it's like um, Tasmania. <laughs> actually maybe maybe uh yeah well, it, it's, it's very remote it's it's not a place that actually Tasmania is a very good place to go <laughs> but it's not a very good place to go for a visit because it's it's such a backwater town uh, area so um for Jesus to remain in Galilee has a has a doesn't actually give him any fame does it because where are all the famous and powerful and rich people at they're down south in Judea 
So for Jesus to remain in Galilee, it doesn't really help um, promote uh, his uh, fame. But he traveled from in Galilee, going from town to town, uh, doing his ministry, whether it's to perform miracles or to heal people or to teach. He went from town to town in Galilee and, re and remained there. Now, we've got to make a note here that uh, John actually comments here that Jesus remained in Galilee, not because the weather was better there or the food was better, but because the people in Judea, the Jewish leaders in Judea, which is down south of Israel, where Jerusalem is, they wanted to kill him. So Jesus, it almost sounds like that John is saying that Jesus remained in Galilee because he was afraid of the Jewish leaders. Now, we might come back to that a bit later, but that's the kind of context we, we have when the brothers of Jesus come to Jesus at this point. When the festival of tabernacles are, uh, are about to happen, his brothers, the brothers of Jesus, so that is, that is children born to Mary, came to Jesus and said, go, go to Jerusalem for this, for this feast, for this festival. His brothers figured that if Jesus wanted to be really famous, right, that he, he had all these followers, he, he, he was growing in fame in Galilee. He said, they were saying, if you want to have impact on the whole nation, if you want to have impact in the whole world, then go to Jerusalem. Make yourself visible. Stand out in public and, and declare who you are. And that's how you can become famous. It's no use for him to stay here in the backwater district of Galilee. As a remote region, nothing of significance happens here. Even um, uh, one of his disciples actually said, can anything good come, come out of Gal uh, Nazareth, which is in Galilee? And, and so to remain in Galilee was, was detrimental to his ministry. That's, a, that's as far as the brothers were concerned. He should be in Jerusalem and show himself to the most powerful and influential of the, of the people. Which is why they say to Jesus in verse 4, in verse 4 they say, no one who wants to become a public figure acts in secret. Since you are doing these things, show yourselves to the world. Show yourself to the world. Make, make yourself famous in the world. And this was the perfect time for Jesus to go down to Jerusalem. Why? Because the Feast of the Tabernacles were about to have happen. The Festival of the Tabernacles were about to happen. Now, if you know about the, the Feast of the Jewish Feast uh, calendar, um, you would recognize that the festival of the tabernacles was one of the three big festivals in a year. Uh, the other two are being the Passover and the, uh, the Pentecost. Okay, so the, you got the three feasts, which is the Pentecost, Passover, and the, uh, the tabernacles. Now, this was a major feast that all male Jews were supposed to come to Jerusalem to celebrate. So if all the male Jews were supposed to come to Jerusalem to celebrate these festivals, how many people would there be in Jerusalem? Quite a lot, right? There will be a lot of people in Jerusalem. So to make himself public in this situation is good, isn't it? If you want to become famous, you do it in front of the most, uh, most amount of people. And that was the, the brother's reasoning, that he should go to uh, the festival. But Jesus refuses to follow their advice. Rather, he tells them that his time has not yet come in verse 6. In fact, he knows that their advice was not from a genuine concern. Why? Because they didn't really believe he was the Messiah. He wasn't speaking to them as if they, uh, from a position of belief. They just thought, oh, he's doing some, some good stuff, right? If 5,000 men followed him after he fed them uh, in the wilderness, then what, what would happen if he did similar miracles down in Jerusalem? If he went down to Jerusalem and did, uh, uh, performed uh, miracles, how many more people would follow Jesus? And that was the reasoning. And they would say, you know, if you go down and do something similar, imagine the number of likes you will get on your post. You know? Imagine the number of retweets. And then imagine the number of people who will be talking about you if you do something amazing down in Jerusalem where everyone will see what you have done. But Jesus is resolute in not going to the festival. Not because he was scared, 
but he had his own reason. He didn't go down, he, he wasn't fearful of the Jewish leaders who was trying to kill him. It wasn't because of that that he didn't go. <clears throat> but we read in verse 10, that as soon as the brothers left, what did Jesus do? As soon as his brothers left for the festival, what did, he, what did Jesus do? He went in secret, right? He didn't stay away. No, he told the brothers that he won't go, but he actually went. So what does, why did Jesus go? Why did Jesus go to Jerusalem when he had already told his brothers that he was not going? Why say one thing to his brothers and then turn around and, and do something else? Is it a, a kind of a, a brother, brotherly or sibling, sibling rivalry? Rivalry where you say one thing to your brother and turn around and say, no, nah, I'm not gonna do it. Right. Is it one of those things where you uh, have a, a sibling banter where you say one thing and do something else? It's not, is it? Why? Because he didn't go because his time was not yet come. The motivation for Jesus to go down to Jerusalem was not to become famous as his brothers urged him to be. If he went when the brothers went and told him to go, what would be the conclusion we'll make about Jesus? What would have motivated Jesus to, to go to Jerusalem if he actually went when his brothers told him to go? He would have been, we would have actually questioned his motivation. We would have said, isn't he motivated by fame? Does he want to make himself famous just as his brothers had urged him? But he said he, will, he won't go because that is not the reason that he came in the first place. He wasn't going to Jerusalem to become famous. In fact, he, how did he go? He went in secret. Now, this doesn't mean that he, came, he went into Jerusalem like a spy trying to get into uh, enemy territory. Right? It's not like sneaking in like a thief in the night. He's actually, it just means that he didn't announce himself in public. He didn't announce himself in public. And, and if you think about it this way, when Jesus enters Jerusalem for the fa final time, how did he enter Jerusalem? Riding on a donkey with people shouting Hosanna to the highest, right? People made a fanfare of his entry at the, in, uh, in the last days when he entered Jerusalem. This was not the time to do that. And so Jesus didn't make a fuss of entering Jerusalem. He just entered. And, and that's what it means when it says in secret. It's not in public. It's not in the open. The word sec secret here is not, doesn't mean that you, you're trying to hide. It's actually saying it's not in the open, right? You're just walking in without making an announcement. That's what Jesus did. He wasn't trying to hide. He just went in. If he was trying to hide, why would he actually go up to the temple courts and start teaching? Right, so we see Jesus entering Jerusalem, not because he wanted to be famous, but he had a different purpose in going to Jerusalem. And it is this purpose that brought him to where he, was, he is at, at this point. And, and we can see this clearly in the encounter with the crowd in Jerusalem. In verse 14, Jesus waited until the festival was halfway through before he entered the temple courts. He didn't go there to publicly announce himself. So he didn't go there to shout out and say, look, look at me, I'm the Messiah. But he didn't try to hide either, did he? He didn't go in in a, in a private prayer or anything like that. He went in to teach as he had always done. And when the people heard him speak, they were all amazed. So he wasn't hiding his, himself from view, nor was he hiding his own teaching. He was public about it but he just didn't make a big fuss about it. And he actually started teaching what he has always taught. And so when people heard what he said, they were all amazed. They were all amazed. Why? Because they couldn't believe what they were hearing from this man. To everyone, they understood, they knew that Jesus was from Galilee. It's probably from his accent. He, they could probably tell from his accent, you know, like uh, the Southern accent in, in America, you, you just know where they are from, if, from uh, hearing from the accent. I'm not too sure whether you can say that as, so much for Australia, because everyone has, it's usually a country versus city. So you can sort of see, it. Uh, yeah, there, there is a bit of this difference in, in um, people from the country, as opposed to people in the city. There's a bit of a, 
I don't, I don't, I don't, I won't say it. <laughs> you know the difference, right? You know the difference when you hear someone who's lived their whole life in the country, who comes in the city and starts speaking, and you say, oh, this is a country boy, right? And it, this would have been the same with Jesus. When he starts speaking, everyone would have known that he was from Galilee. So is, was there a famous center of learning or teaching or in, in Galilee? Was there a famous teacher teaching in Galilee? No. Galilee was no place. And so how could this country bumpkin from Galilee have such knowledge and understanding that everyone was amazed? And, and so that's the question they were asking. How could he have such great learning without having been taught? And they, could find, they found it hard to believe. This is because the traditional form of education at this time was to be taught by another person. So if you wanted to be educated, if you wanted to be a teacher, what, you, what did you have to do? You have to be taught by another teacher. It's like a one-to-one -one -one discipleship, right? So you actually go to someone and they teach you all the wise sayings and you memorize it. And you base your th teaching and your thinking based on what you have been taught. And, and so without having a formal education like this, where someone actually took him on board, under his wing and taught him, how could Jesus come to such great understanding of the scriptures? And, and this was right because any teacher at that time, if they wanted to be accepted as legitimate, if they wanted to be a legitimate teacher, they had to show that they were taught by someone famous, whether it is by quoting that famous person or, or having that, uh, having their uh, teaching or knowledge corroborated by previous teachings, they have to show that they are not someone who just came up and uh, and taught what they uh, came up with. They have to actually teach in on the in accordance to what they have been taught. It's a bit like this: How can you tell if an engineer is qualified by a certificate, by the degree? isn't it? By the many certificate and the experience. If you can't show your degree, then can you actually be employed as an engineer? No, you can't. If you want to be a, a teacher in, in a school, what do you need? You need qualifications, right? So in the same way, for Jesus to stand up and be a teacher of the people, how can, how can he show that he's qualified? Well, what was the normal way of showing that they were qualified? You have to prove that you were taught by someone who was a teacher. You only uh, can be seen as a teacher when someone else has taught you. And what you say is based on what they have taught you. But what about Jesus? Was he taught by someone? He wasn't, was he? He wasn't taught by any famous rabbi or, or teacher. So how could he prove that he's, a, he's a, a teacher worth listening to? And that's what the people were saying. They were amazed. How could this man have such great understanding without having been taught by another teacher? They couldn't accept him as a teacher without knowing his roots. And that is what Jesus does in verse 16, when he says that his teaching is not his own. He says that if he would taught on his own, then he's seeking his own glory. Right? But he said his teaching is not his own body. It is the one who sent him. Jesus is teaching on the authority and on the basis of the one who actually sent him. And who, who sent him? It is God. So Jesus appeals to the authority of God to prove that his teaching should be accepted, must be accepted. What he taught and said are not what he came up with. They were given to him by God. So Jesus appeals to God for what he taught. And there lies the problem. Who can know what Jesus said was from God? Now, if I said to you, I'm speaking from God, and this is what God said, what would you say? <laughs> if you're uh, any good uh, Presbyterian, right? You'll be laughing at my face, right? If I spoke to you and said, you know, what I'm telling you now is directly from God, then you'll be laughing. But if I said, this is God's word in the Bible, and this is what God's word says, 
then you will listen. Why? Because authority is not from myself, but from the Bible, from God's word. And that's what Jesus is saying. But how could the people at that time know that Jesus was speaking from God? How could he prove it? With human teachers, what do you have? You have words that they have said, being either being written down or being memorized by the disciples. So they, you can actually trace their teachings through their disciples and their writings. But when Jesus claims that his teaching is from God, what can you use to test it? How can you test that Jesus, what Jesus taught is from God? The only way this can be known is as Jesus says in verse 17, where he says, <clears throat> anyone who chooses to do the will of God will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. How can you know? How can you know that Jesus teach, what Jesus taught is from God? Only if you choose to do God's will. Hang on. How does that work? Almost like a circular argument, isn't it? You know, if you want to know what God's will is, then you have to, you have to believe what Jesus said. Hang on. But if you don't want to believe what Jesus said, you have to do God's will. Doesn't make sense. <laughs> does it? Well, what does it mean to do God's will? I, I guess that's the real question then, isn't it? What does it mean to do God's will? And according to John chapter 6, verse 40, what is the will of God? What is the will of God according to verse, chapter 6, verse 40? Jesus says, For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in Him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. What is the will of God? That everyone believes in Jesus, the one he sent. Who is the one who does the will of God? The one who believes in Jesus. Unless you believe in Jesus, you cannot put faith or trust what Jesus said is true. That leaves us with a conundrum, doesn't it? How can you believe? How can you do if you don't know? Which is why Jesus says in verse 7 that the world hates him. Why? Because they couldn't believe. They could not believe that he was the son of God. They could not believe that he was the light of the world coming into the world to expose the darkness. Because they, the world does not believe in Jesus, they cannot accept his word as true. And this is the case with the crowd and especially the Jewish leaders. So Jesus accuses them in verse 19. He accuses them of failure to obey the law and especially the law of the law against murder and that's what he's saying here in verse 19 but they did not try to kill jesus because he blasphemed but because they were jealous of his authority and popularity if jesus had blasphemed then the jews had a legitimate reason to kill him isn't that because what does it say in the law if someone blasphemes against God, what is their sentence? It's to be death, to be stoned to death. So if they wanted to kill him because of his blasphemy, then they were, it was legitimate. It, was actually, it wasn't breaking the law. It was actually keeping the law, isn't it? But what is the motivation behind their desire to kill him? It wasn't because he blasphemed, but because they were jealous. The Jewish leaders could not accept that an uneducated man from the country could be more knowledgeable and popular than the best scholars in Jerusalem. Their motivation to kill Jesus was not because of righteous anger, but because of their jealousy. So when Jesus accuses them of breaking the law, they reply in verse 20, you are the demon possessed. Now, when, he's, when they say demon possessed, it doesn't mean that they actually think that he's, he has a demon. He's actually saying, I, I think it's a, uh, a way of saying, you are mad. Oh, you are mad to think that we want to kill you. But Jesus proves their murderous intent by recalling the miracle he performed on the Sabbath. Remember back in John chapter 5, when there was a paralytic next to the, um, the pool of Salom? Right? And what, what, what did Jesus do? He told the man to get up, 
take up a mat and go. And when did he do that? He did that on the Sabbath. And, and we read there in John chapter 5, verse 18, it is because Jesus did that, that they wanted to kill him all the more. And so their intent to kill him stemmed not from righteous anger, but because of their jealousy. For if they allowed a baby to be circumcised on the Sabbath, right? Why would that, that happen? Because according to Lord, the law of Moses, when does a baby have to be circumcised? Especially, specifically on the eighth day. So if, uh, if the baby is born eight days before the Sabbath, when will that baby be circumcised? A day before or the day after? No, on the day of the, of the eighth day. Has to be, because that's what the law says. So if the circumcision law is, doesn't break Sabbath law, then what is, what is he just saying? Why should uh, the healing of a whole person be against the law? The logic of the argument is, if circumcision, the marking of the flesh as symbol of God's covenant takes precedence over Sabbath keeping, then surely healing a person supersedes the law, Sabbath law. For if circ what, is, what is circumcision? Circumcision affects uh, a, a small part of the body, doesn't it? Circumcision affects a small part of the body. It's, it's the marking of one part of the body. But what, is, what does healing do? Healing affects the whole body. So if, you are, if, you cannot, if the law allows you to mark a small part of the flesh on the Sabbath, then shouldn't it be the case that the whole body should be allowed to be healed on the Sabbath? And that's what Jesus is arguing. If the lesser is allowed, then the, the greater should be allowed as well. And at, at this, the Jewish leaders had no answer. They remained silent. Now, in this episode, we see clearly that Jesus is not motivated by personal glory and fame. His ministry was not about gaining greater number of followers or to making his name great. But rather, his ministry was about fulfilling God's will in God's time. That's why he didn't go to Jerusalem when his brothers told him to go. And that is also why Jesus still went when he knew that the Jewish leaders were trying to kill him. For he also knew that the people were ignorant of God's salvation. They may have the law, but had no clue in how to be saved. They didn't have any idea how to escape God's judgment. So when God's salvation appeared before them, what did they do? They had no idea. They rejected him and called him mad for what he taught. They could not acknowledge that the words of Jesus as true, nor could they see that his miracles are the proof that he was actually sent by God. So what did they see? What did the Jewish leaders see in Jesus? They didn't see a Messiah. They didn't see one who was teaching from God, but all they saw was a threat to their own popularity. All they saw was a threat to their own um, authority as teachers of the people. But for Jesus, his earthly ministry was not about being popular. His earthly ministry was not about becoming famous in the world. His ministry was to fulfill God's will. What was God's will? That all those who believe in his name will be saved. Jesus did what he did whether to go or not to go, whether to teach or not to teach, everything he did was to fulfill God's will, which is to bring salvation to people. His ministry was about saving people. His ministry was not about becoming the most famous teacher. His ministry was not about becoming the most likable person or popular, not to become the latest fad on the internet. That's not his purpose. His purpose was saving of souls. What does that say about us then? If Jesus did what he did in every situation for, in the, pur for the purpose of fulfilling God's will in, his, in God's time, what motivates us in our daily life? What motivates you in doing what you do every day? 
whether it is um, having family time with your family, whether it's working, whether it's going out or, or, or on the streets, you know, what, what, what do you do? What is the purpose in, in, in what you do in your life? Are we more motivated by personal glory? Do we seek fame and glory in what we do? Do we want to become instantly famous like, like people on the internet? Are we motivated by fear? Do we fear what we might lose if we continue to be upfront about our Christianity? Do we fear to be persecuted, ridiculed, made redundant because of our faith? Are we motivated by fear or fame in, in how, we, how we live our godly life? You know, Jesus neither desired personal glory, no fear to lose his life. In fact, he laid down his life, didn't he? His motivation was to do the will of God and to bring people to salvation by faith. If that is the will of God, that people turn to Jesus and believe in him, what should be our motivation? What should be our motivation in our conversation with uh, unbelievers? Is it to become famous? Is it to avoid fear, avoid shame? Or should our motivation be about revealing Jesus? What does it say? Only those who does the will of God can know that what Jesus teaches is true. How can people know who Jesus is unless we share it to them? How can they know to follow Jesus unless we actually talk to them about God and about Jesus? And if you're not confident about sharing the gospel, then there's a great opportunity after the service to learn how to teach, how to share the gospel. If your motivation is to share the gospel in every aspect of your life, every moment of your life in God's time, in God's grace, then shouldn't you equip yourself and make sure that you can share the gospel? Shouldn't your first motivation be, I have to be equipped I have to know God's word in order to share it. So let me challenge you, all of you and challenge myself as well. Let's re re focus, actually um, think about what motivates us. Why do we say what we say? Why do we do what we do? Is it because we are fearful? Is it because we seek personal glory? Or is it because we want to do God's will in his time. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for your word and revealing Jesus to us. Lord, we give you thanks and praise that Jesus did what he did, not for his own personal glory, not to escape <clears throat> punishment or uh, to escape death. But Lord, he did all of this for your glory, to do your will. And so, Lord, we pray that that motivation will be our motivation as well, that in everything we do in life, that we may be motivated in, to share the gospel, to take every opportunity to speak about Jesus to people. And, Lord, we also pray that you will equip us as well, that we may be confident in sharing the gospel. And, and so, Lord, we pray that you'll use us as your instrument to preach the gospel to people who need to hear it, and that you will work in their hearts to bring them to faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> okay, we will sing our final song. And just a reminder that there's a collection box at the back for the uh, offering as well. So let's sing our final song. Damien? Uh, yeah. Um, thanks for the message. Um, Jesus wouldn't make a very good politician, would he? Because um, he's not exactly winning any popularity contests today. And um, I don't know if it'd even be on Facebook, but the irony is that um, he wouldn't win an election if he came, well, he's here. I mean, he hasn't returned physically to work today, but if he was here and he was in the election, he wouldn't win. But it's ironic that the, the, the leader we need and the leader that we're gonna get one day is the one that we wouldn't vote for. Well, we would as Christians, but the world doesn't want him. So um, yeah, thanks for the message, yeah, fame. And, um, I'll give thanks now and I've, I've, I'll, do a, I'll do a closing prayer and this closing prayer will be retrospective because <laughs> I didn't do the opening prayer, did I? See? Hey, I'm just a man and I'm rusty. Oh dear.
and I'm tired and I'm worn, worn out, <laughs> like a lot of us. So, um, yeah, thanks for that. Thanks for listening, everybody. And, um, yeah, good message, Damien. I know you don't take any credit. God gets the glory for all of us. I mean, we're all, we're all instruments. We're all fallen. Um, anyway, shut up, Ron. I'll, yeah, I'll just, um, I'll give thanks. Okay. Uh, great, great Father, we do thank you for this um, message. We thank you for this day. We thank you that we come, can come and hear, Father, words of life. And um, we know that Jesus wasn't seeking fame, Father, but um, we need Jesus. And in this world, we, you know, we, we all, you know, in one way or another, we are building our own little kingdoms, Father, whereas the kingdom we should be working towards and helping to build uh, is your kingdom, Father. And towards that end, Father, the offering is part of the way we can do that. Uh, we pray that you'll use what we give, um, whether, it's, whether it's money or our time or effort or, you know, even prayers, not shouldn't say even prayers, but prayer and our lives, Father, help, help us to dedicate all of um, what we have, all of what we do, all of what we think, our whole lives, help us to dedicate it, Father, to, towards building your kingdom and, and spreading the message. And, and hopefully we, we'll learn more about that after, after church. Father, on this day, um, which in Australia is Anzac Day, we do commemorate uh, the sacrifice, the lives of all the men and women, Father, who, who, gave their, who gave their lives, some of them, a lot of them, Father, and to, to help to keep us free. Uh, so we remember them, Father, and um, thank you that we can live in this country where we are free and we, can, and we can hear messages like this preached today. So please be with all our men and women who are serving overseas and the armed forces and, and the families, Father, and those who have lost people. We're all touched by this and we remember this today. But most of all, we give you thanks, Father, for sending your son uh, to die for us, Father, and um, give us life and give us hope for the future. We thank you, Father, and we pray these things and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, let's say the grace. Yeah. I will say PowerPoint instead. May the grace of the Lord, Lord Jesus Christ and the love of the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen.